from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Now, all the writers here at the festival this, this past two days, uh, these past two days, have, have been distinguished. But I've been lucky enough to draw the two who actually need no introduction whatsoever. <laughs> and those of you here yesterday know I, um, I had a conversation with Toni Morrison. Uh, and today I get to finish the, the, the festival by introducing Garrison Keillor. I'm sure that everyone here knows that he is the longtime mastermind and performer of Prairie Home Companion, now approaching 40 years on the radio. As well as the man behind the Writer's Almanac and three anthologies of poems. Wonderful poems, by the way. And this afternoon, he's going to talk about his most recent collection, Good Poems, American Places. And so without further ado, let me introduce Garrison Keillor. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Back in the day, my little daughter, we didn't pay for a bottle of water. Back when Elvis was alive and coffee didn't cost $3.95. Back then there was no internet. Google hadn't been invented yet. There were no chat rooms for us to go to we just sat around and talked to people we knew. <laughs> there were no, there were no seat belts, no airbags. You stood on the front seat next to your dad <laughs> as he drove along drinking his beer. <laughs> or you sat on his lap and you helped him steer. Every Sunday, we went for a drive to see the leaves when fall arrived. There was no iPod to stick in your ear. Your parents were all there was to hear. <laughs> I was autistic back in the day, but I didn't know it, so I was okay. <laughs> I had no shrink with a big black beard. People just looked at me and said, well, he's weird. <laughs> and left me alone. And for therapy, I spent all day in the library looking up things. Had no iPad, but I was a kid, and it wasn't that bad. Back in the day, my little child, there were no play dates. We just ran wild. We played in the streets. We played in the ruins. Half the time, they had no idea what we were doing. We ran like coyotes in big herds and learned to smoke and say bad words <laughs> and jump out of trees if they dared you to. My mother would have been terrified, but she never knew. I'm fascinated watching you. <laughs> show me, show me drinking beer again. I need to see that. <laughs> yeah. I represent the low end of poetry. So that's why they brought me on last. <laughs> I started out an idealist. My people were separatists. They belonged to a separatist sect. 
called the Sanctified Brethren. And we held ourselves away from the rest of the world to keep ourselves pure and to keep our carnal impulses under control. But I got over it early. <laughs> Staying separate from the rest of the world only wetted my, that's wetted with an H, not, <laughs> not wetted, <laughs> wetted my appetite for all that the world had to offer. Because I learned Elizabethan poets in junior high school who were not separate from the world. William Shakespeare had an unhappy marriage in Stratford, and so it prompted him to go into London and become an actor and to give us those sonnets, none of which were about Anne Hathaway. <laughs> Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, he wrote, but there were nothing but impediments in his marriage to Anne. There's an irony for you, unhappiness leading to art, but it happens all the time. I learned those beautiful poets who had a very low life expectancy, Robert Herrick, Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, and all of their poems said the same thing that summer is brief, life is brief, it is so beautiful. As Emily Dickinson said, life is so all-encompassing, there's little time left for anything else. <laughs> and that from someone who spent most of her mature years in her father's house and a great deal of it in her upstairs bedroom. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed to comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can give the definition so clear of victory as he defeated dying on whose forbidden ear the distant sounds of triumph burst agonized and clear. So I loved the poets who wrote about love, since love was what I did not have. I was 13 years old. I was almost six feet tall. I weighed 136 pounds. I had odd half-rim, horn-rim glasses. I had a home haircut <laughs> with the telltale sign that the big arc shaved up over your ears, high water pants, wrists sticking out of your cuffs, hand-me-down clothes, most of them from my older brother, some from my older sister. <laughs> Jeans that zipped up the side. So no wonder you would learn poems like come live with me and be my love and we will all the pleasures prove that this brief summer yields and we will sit upon the rocks by shallow waterfalls and listen to melodious flocks of birds sing madrigals. O oh, daffodils we weep to see you haste away so soon as yet the early morning sun had not attained its noon. So gather rosebuds while ye may, for time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. I had no conception of mortality when I was 13, of course. But you put these things into your head, and then you remember them when you are of an age that you can understand them. There was a time when grove and stream and every common sight had all the freshness of a dream 
and radiance so bright. Though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, the loveliness of summer flower, its glory soon is past. Because they had covered the high ground, I then felt no obligation to try to do it myself. <laughs> so I wrote poems like, oh, what a luxury it be, what pleasure, oh, what perfect bliss, how ordinary and yet chic to pee, to piss, to take a leak. <laughs> to feel your bladder just go free <laughs> and open like the mighty miss and all your cares go down the creek to pee, to piss, to take a leak. <laughs> For gentlemen of great physique, who can hold water for one week. <laughs> for ladies who one quarter cup of tea can fill completely up. <laughs> for folks in your analysis, for little kids just learning this, for everyone it's pretty great to urinate. <laughs> Women are more circumspect, but men can piss with great effect with terrible hydraulic force can make a stream or change its course. <laughs> can put out fires or cigarettes and sometimes laying down our bets. Late at night outside the bars, we like to aim up at the stars. Oh yes, for men, it's much more grand. Women sit or squat, we stand and hold the fellow in our hand. <laughs> and proudly watch the mighty arc, adjust the range and make our mark on stones and posts for rival men to smell and not come back again. That was beautiful. You did a beautiful job. <laughs> Human sperm is very small. Five microns, that's about all. It's just a cell with a dangly tail. Not as big as the ovum, but still you have to love them. And they're produced in the testes of the male. Beneath their shiny domes, they contain your chromosomes. And the tail can kick just like a leg. Nothing could be finer than to swim up a vagina <laughs> in search of a rendezvous with an egg. The sperm have one ambition, and that's to gain admission to the female reproductive canal. And once they get in it, they go a millimeter a minute along with 40 million of their pals. <laughs> the sperm is no boob, when it smells the fallopian tube, it goes into some crazy figure eights about 10,000 times as those female enzymes keep egging him on to penetrate. <laughs> the sperm all advance and they do their little dance, but only one gets through the egg membrane and the union of those two, that's what led to you so be thankful that your dad did not abstain. <laughs> that old man in the garage once let loose a great barrage. <laughs> and though he is now ancient and infirm and his breath is bad, children, he's your dad. 
because he contributed his sperm. You can get them from a bank or from Jim or John or Frank. But when it comes to fatherhood, there's just one man to thank. He was young and he was dumb, but when things began to hum, he did not withdraw. He became your pa. <laughs> and that is where we all come from. The only good reason to write a poem is to impress a woman. <laughs> I think Shakespeare may have felt the same way. And when he wrote, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. I think he had one person in mind, his great poem about the redemptive power of love. When Yeats wrote, wine it comes in at the mouth and love comes at the eye. That is all we know of truth for we grow old and die. I lift the glass up to my mouth and look at you and sigh. He had someone in mind and I'm sure that he gave the poem to her as soon as he possibly could, handwritten on vellum paper, and watched for her reaction. To have one passionate reader would be preferable to having a thousand indifferent readers. And you never know who might read a poem and take it personally. You could only hope for that. <laughs> you made crusty bread rolls filled with chunks of brie and minced garlic drizzled with olive oil. We ate them lovingly, our legs coiled together under a table. And salmon and dill and lemon and whole wheat couscous baked with fresh ginger and garlic and a hill of green beans and carrots roasted with honey and tofu. It was beautiful, the candles, the linen, the silver, the sun shining down on our northern street. Me with my hand on your leg, you my lover, in your jeans and green t-shirt and beautiful bare feet. How simple life is we buy a fish, we are fed, we sit close to each other, we talk, and then we go to bed. It's a sonnet that I wrote years ago, years ago for someone who made me exactly that meal. Margaret was the smartest girl in the 11th grade. Tall with dark hair, tied up in a tight French braid. She was the only girl I knew who read Albert Camus. And for that very reason I did too. I stood behind her in choir, a lonely baritone. But when I smelled her exotic French cologne, and felt the existential heat of her body. I became Luciano Pavarotti. <laughs> In choir when I was 17, I met the beautiful Christine, the woman I adored. And as the choir sang praises to the Lord, I sang to the back of Christine's head, many, many things that could never be said. Oh, oh, oh. I tried to invent a new form, the singable sonnet.
The beauty of the sonnet being, first of all, that it is only 14 lines, and so it imposes a limit on you. And you discover that so often 14 lines really is enough. And it carries with it a rhyme and a scheme of rhyme and meter that make it memorable, which is the hope of any writer that your work might catch on somebody's memory like a, like a sand burr and stick to them. The way those poems did that I read when I was 13, loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough, it stands along the woodland ride, wearing white for Eastertide, a sonnet that kicks, bounces along in a beautiful, in a beautiful tempo, and you remember it, you remember it for decades. I had a stroke, and one of the first things I did when I finally collected my faculties was to find out how many of my faculties I still had. And did I still remember when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes? And did I still remember out in the West Texas town of El Paso, I fell in love with a Mexican girl? And I did, for the most part, remember them and remembered my own sonnets as well. In the morning when she awoke, my dear lover, in bed on her back, buck naked, <laughs> I crept under the cotton sky and over a hill with tufts of seagrass and snaked my way into a ravine and there found a delicate sea creature trembling with sensation, a pink anemone and touched it and whoa, the sound of a soprano singing French, Italian and Croatian <laughs> simultaneously and touched it with my tongue and tasted caviar and cabernet and from above was sweetly sung a Puccini aria by Billie Holiday so prettily and then a shudder and a sigh and we lay quietly the opera star and I oh 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 oh, oh, oh. let me sing you one more Back in the day, my little daughter, <laughs> we didn't pay for a bottle of water. This is a prayer, and we can wind up with this, and uh, then if you have any questions. This is an unusual prayer in that it's a prayer for the existence of God, not for anything more specific than that. I don't think you'll find anything of the sort in the Book of Common Prayer or hear anything of the sort in the Evangelical Lutheran Church, but you should. Here I am, O Lord, and here is my prayer. Please be there. Don't want to ask too much, miracles and such. Just whisper in the air, please be there. When I die like other folks, don't want to find out you're a hoax. So I'm not on my knees asking for world peace or that the polar ice cap freeze and save the polar bear or even that the poor be fed or angels hover o'er my bed. 
but I would sure be pissed if I should have been an atheist. <laughs> oh, Lord, please exist. Oh, oh, oh. I have one more poem, which I will not do. Out of deference to the signers, I will not do my poem, which consists of the names of the 87 counties of Minnesota. <laughs> Aiken, Anoka, Becker, Beltrami, Benton, Beestone, Blue Earth, Round, Carleton, Carver, Cass, Chippewa, Chisago, Clay, Clearwater, Cook, Cottonwood, Crowing, Dakota, Dodge, Douglas, Faribault, Freemore, Freemore, Goodhue, Grand, Hennepin, Houston, Hubbard, Isandy, Itasca, Jackson, Kennebec, Candy, Ohio, Kitson, Kuchiching, Lake of Lake of the Woods, LeSueur, Lyon, Macau, Mar 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 I won't do the rest of it. I'll just leave it right. <laughs> leave that back. Thank you so much. Thank you to the signers. So then, so then, I just wanted to make it interesting for the signers, that's all. <laughs> and glad that you were here as well. I, I think there are microphones in here if, if you have a, a, a question or anything that you'd like to ask that I would know anything about. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, for those of us who have not yet had the pleasure of seeing Prairie Home Companion live, yes. can you tell us any details on any retirement plans? My retirement plans. <laughs> retirement is a treacherous uh, step uh, for, for anybody. I did it once already uh, when I was um, 40, 46, I think. And uh, it was a huge, a huge mistake. It's a treacherous step. You, 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 know, you, you, you think that you're going to be free and, and, and live a different kind of a life. But by this age, you only know how to live one kind of life. <laughs> and all sorts of things follow. It's a slippery slope, is what I'm saying, retirement. And uh, you take that step, and, th and then suddenly people are calling you sir. <laughs> and, uh, and, and people are, are, are reaching for your elbow as you go downstairs. <laughs> and and uh, you go to get into your car to drive, you know, after dark, and people are suggesting maybe they ought to drive. And, and then that leads to other things. And, and before you know it, you are, you, you, they shovel you into the Good Shepherd home, and, uh, and you're forced to hang out with people you've been avoiding all of your life. <laughs> and so, it's very hard on people. No, my, uh, my, my hope is to just to get other people to do the work and, uh, <laughs> and to become a sort of a gray, a gray eminence, which I almost am now, so. Yes, somebody standing directly behind you. Yes, sir. I was just wondering if they have anything like this in Lake Wobegon, you know, poetry, uh, recitation, book festival, that sort of thing. When people gather under a tent in Lake Wobegon, and there is a speaker. He's not talking like I'm talking here today. <laughs> He's talking about hellfire and damnation. And, uh, and he carries that message right straight to everybody under the tent. And he walks around, a big, tall, skinny man with, 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 with black hair falling into his eyes. And he keeps brushing it back. We have no idea who he is, but you know, he, he comes to town uh, regularly. And he carries a, an enormous black leather King James Bible like a hand grenade in his left hand. <laughs> And he never actually opens it because he knows it by heart, everything that he wants to, everything that he wants to know. And, uh, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what he'd be, that's what he would be, uh, he would be preaching. Be sure your sin will find you out. And he, and he bears down hard on young people just like yourself. <laughs> you come down front, come down front weeping, weeping. Very different from today. <laughs> Very different. Was there another? Uh... Yes. Every other time around. Right? I'm sorry. Oh, there's um, another microphone over there. Yes. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I'm just wondering uh, what, how does 
the writing uh, at Prairie Home Companion is compared to the writing that you do for Prairie Home Companion and, all, and how they affect each other? Well, I, I write uh, Prairie Home Companion, so I wrote uh, yesterday's show. It differs from uh, other writing in that uh, with other writing, uh, if I'm working on a book or um, I just wrote a review for the Times Book Review. Uh, I consider it a point of honor uh, to be at least two weeks past deadline and uh, <laughs> six months if possible. It's a game that's played between writers and editors. Um, writing for a Prairie Home Companion, you do not have that luxury. And so you... Um, you write, uh, I, I, I wrote the show on Friday morning. There was a rehearsal uh, at the theater on Friday uh, late afternoon. And um, I realized that most of what I had written on Friday morning was, was, really, was really not worth it. And uh, <laughs> so I went home and I rewrote it. But you see, the point is that, that, that nothing is ever finished. There's no such thing as, as finishing a piece of writing. It simply is taken away from you, that's all. <laughs> and uh, and uh, with Prairie Home Companion, it's, it's taken away at 5 o'clock Central Time on Saturday. <laughs> and there is no going beyond that. I have sometimes stood on stage with uh, Sharpie, and uh, I have marked up actors uh, scripts as they were reading, uh, <laughs> but it's not that easy, uh, not that easy to do. With books, it's a whole other thing. I'm, I'm writing a Guy Noir uh, mystery right now, and it's way past that. Way. You get pleading letters from your editor, and uh, she's just weeping, begging you. And, and, and it just gives me a strange kind of pleasure, that's all. <laughs> yes, sir. So I have a religious question. Yes, sir. Have you become a born-again Unitarian? A born-again Unitarian. <laughs> well, that would be an amazing thing, wouldn't it? How would that happen? You would uh, just go to a coffee shop on Sunday morning and <laughs> just it would just suddenly come over you? There's a gospel hymn that reads, The Old Rugged Question Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I, I did it once as a sanctified brethren child, and, uh, and uh, we believe that it took, but we're not sure, of course. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm a big fan of Guy Noir, and I'm just curious, what was the inspiration for that character? What was the origination? Uh, inspiration. Integration. The inspiration, yeah. inspiration, integration. Integration would be an interesting question. Um, uh, how, how is that character integrated into public radio? That, that character is sort, of, is sort of contrary to public radio. And that was, and that was really the inspiration of it, you know, was, was being aware of, of um, the constrictions of, of good taste and, uh, you know, to find a way around it somehow. So Guy Noir is is uh, is the only person in public radio who can uh, who can really admire women in a frank way, <laughs> right? I think so. I mean, you know, she walked in and and she was tall and she had blonde hair that fell down on her shoulders like a waterfall that any man would have been proud to go over. <laughs> she was. Skinny, she, her pants, her jeans were so tight I could read the embroidery on her underwear. <laughs> it said Tuesday. <laughs> they can't say that on All Things Considered. They wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't last long. There's the, uh, there's the whole, there's the whole rationale for fiction right there. It's just, being able to let let loose a little bit. Was there somebody over this side? Yes. 
Yes. yes. Oh, and there you are. Yes, I am. And I don't have a question. I just want to tell you thank you. I discovered you seven and a half years ago while I was sitting in my apartment after experiencing an electrical outage. I was on St. Thomas, St. Thomas U.S. Virgin Islands. The power oh, yeah. had gone out, uh -huh. and I had just recently moved there, and I didn't know what to do. And I had a little portable radio that I'd gotten from when I was a Girl Scout troop leader. Wow. And so I turned it on, and uh -huh. I fished through, and I finally found something, and it sounded interesting, and I couldn't figure out if this was real yeah. or... Yeah. Yeah. So it ended up being rebroadcast the following day, oh. and we still didn't really have power. Yeah. And I found you again, wow. and I kept finding you every Saturday and Sunday. We were meant to meet. Yes, we were. Yes. So I, this, this is my first book festival, and I only came because I opened up the city paper, and I saw your name listed, mm. and I made it here today. Well, here you are. Yes. Thank you. So please continue to do what you do. Well, we'll do my best. Yes, sir. Man in the red shirt here. Right. DC decided, or has decided, for a while to close its libraries on a Sunday. Uh -huh. And I was wondering what you thought of that. Closing libraries on Sunday is very superficial. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, I would, I would keep any, any public facility open that's in use. And, uh, and so I have to assume that they were, that they were, that they were being used. Um, but, but, but the libraries have, have undergone you know, a, a, a very sharp change, you know, with the, with the internet and the introduction of Google. I mean, right. for anybody who writes uh, a radio show on Friday morning, uh, <laughs> Google is a godsend, <laughs> you know? And so I don't go down to the library yeah. and pour through volumes, you know, to, to, to find out what I need to know about the migratory habits of the common loon. <laughs> I, I, I want it for a little sketch and, and zap, Maybe it's I'm there. officially old now that I want to go to libraries. So. Yeah, but, but so libraries just have, to, just have to reinvent themselves as the rest of us do. I think they have a future as some kind of sanctuary. <laughs> and uh, and I, because, because, because people who, who love the internet gradually become aware of, of a kind of an OCD uh, reliance on the internet, and they need somebody to cut them off. <laughs> and I think the libraries have a future as a place where you will go and tall women with their hair tied back in buns, <laughs> wearing sensible shoes, <laughs> and a pencil stuck in their hair will make you get offline. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'm hoping that you can give me some advice. Um, I'm, of course I'm here to give advice. <laughs> I too am a parent of a teenage daughter. Oh. And after a very hard day in which she promised to dance on my grave, and not only that, uh -huh. What can you offer to me to read so that I can remember why I enjoy being a parent? <laughs> they are, they are, a teenage daughter is, um, is sent to you by God as a sort of divine justice. <laughs> um, My mother's in to avenge your, your blessed mother. Um, <laughs> And also because they're just so dramatic and they're so interesting and, they're, and, and their English is fractured and, 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 and they're addicted to texting and they do it so well and, and there's all this data going on in their heads. And, um, and that's the future. So we have, to, we have to be in favor of the future, right? We have to just stand back and watch. How old is she? Thirteen. Thirteen, same age as mine. So there you are. Yes, I yes, was yes. pregnant at the same time, and um, I picked out a name to raise, and I thought 
tell the silly usual, and then I found out that you had said that to your daughter, Julie. <laughs> yes. Well, if it's any comfort, daughters are much harder on their mothers. <laughs> and so look at it from my point of view. <laughs> Michigan, Michigan. Um, bum, 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 the leader of the pack. You, sir, have a distinctive countenance. I did what? You have a a distinctive countenance, and I have two questions in that yes, regard. Sir. Yeah. The first is, have you ever written a poem about your distinctive countenance? And the second would be, how did that work for you when you were 13 with that uh, clothing um, ensemble you were describing earlier? The, uh, the closing ensemble. Clothing. Clothing ensemble. I, I'm, I'm in radio, and, uh, and you just, you don't, you don't worry about your countenance uh, uh, what's, uh, whatsoever, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's dark, it's, it's dim, you know, it's not a bright light on you, you don't think about it, and you never, and you never listen to yourself, um, you never, I, I don't listen to the show, and uh, I do the show, I enjoy doing the show, but I wouldn't enjoy listening to it, and in, in the same way, I don't look at photographs of myself, I don't sit and study them, it's, n it's none of my business, it's, it's, <laughs> other people's problem, it's not mine. <laughs> you can only, you can only take on so much trouble and, uh, and don't take on any more than, than you're entitled to take on. I have a 13 year old daughter. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, well, uh, some of your writing has sort of a, a regional flavor, I guess you could say. And uh, I was wondering, what kind of writer do you think you'd be if you had been born someplace um, less interesting, like, say, the East Coast? I don't know. Where, where on the East Coast? Delaware? Delaware. Delaware. <laughs> well, the beauty, the beauty of, of the Midwest, you see, is that... Is that uh, is that most people in America have never been there. <laughs> and this immediately gives you a, a, a great deal of latitude. And, and, and when you tell people on the East Coast, including Delaware, uh, that you're from Minnesota, there's a, there's a long pause. <laughs> and they say, it gets cold there, doesn't it? <laughs> so, we, we, are, we are a state of mystery, but we're also an iconic state. Coal, winter. So here we are, we're in, we're in late September, and if you are telling stories for a living, you can start getting into winter in about another two, three weeks. <laughs> we won't actually get winter in Minnesota until November, maybe even early December, but nobody's gonna come checking on you. So you can uh, you can you can put them all in a little white house that's uh, that's you know leaning off to the southeast because the wind is out of the northwest and and white out blizzards and uh, and poor children uh, going to catch the bus uh, unable to see their hands in front of their faces and 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 digging caves into the snow and 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 surviving there for 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 weeks on end and, and becoming feral and, uh, and uh, being raised by coyotes. I mean, you can, you, can, you can tell this sort of a story and it will be half believed in, in, in the East Coast, including, including in Delaware. Um, I, t I, ha I, I have gone out East and have told a story about uh, being in a whiteout blizzard and being picked up to go to school in a sleigh pulled by two black horses and a man with a handlebar mustache and reins wound around his forearms 
and the, and the sleigh, lying in the sleigh with other whimpering children going through the storm and, and under a buffalo robe. And, and I just like to watch the faces of the audience as I <laughs> tell this story. And most, they're mostly with me. <laughs> and then I have the sleigh go down onto the ice of the Mississippi River <laughs> and swerve from side to side to avoid tattered men in gray who are hiding behind rocks and trees, the last remnants of the Army of Northern Virginia. <laughs> and still some people are with me. <laughs> Teenagers, but you know. <laughs> you take what you can get. Now it just offers such enormous advantages to be from Minnesota that I think anybody from the East Coast who is a serious writer should be head, head out west. Minnesota, South Dakota, Wyoming, take your pick. <laughs> Ohio State, just one school after another that's humiliated our teams. Actually, I don't have a question. I just came up for equal time. Yes. Michigan and then the Superior State. Good, good, okay. Ohio State. We love you. Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh. Why did I ever leave Ohio? <laughs> All right. Thanks again to our son. Oh, 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 one more, whoa, 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 one more. Yes. yes I was yes. wondering, uh, from one Norwegian Minnesotan to the other, yeah. uh, what do you prefer better, hot dish or uh, lutefisk? <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what that is, could you please describe what lutefisk is exactly? Lutefisk is, uh, is a holiday delicacy, uh, which is made of cod. Uh, which has been dried uh, so that it resembles elm bark. <laughs> and uh, it's been dried with the use of lye. And, uh, and so when, it's, uh, when it is reconstituted and water is added to it, it has a particularly pungent lye aroma about it. It has to be rinsed many, many, many times. And, um, and even then, uh, to some people with a, with a great deal of imagination, it still smells of lye, so that it's, it's like eating soap. <laughs> but, uh, but there is good, good lutefisk, and then there's the other lutefisk. And so you want to choose your cook carefully. And, and, that's, and that's true of anything, anything in life. But uh, you want to go to a small town, and, um, and if you find a woman in her mid to late 70s, maybe early 80s, uh, a woman um, with an old apron and kind of loose upper arms. Uh, that's your, that's your lutefisk cook. <laughs> All right. One more? Yes? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I always appreciate when you're down there at the Ryman or whatever, what are your impressions of the Nashville scene and how that works with uh, your overall show and so forth? I know nothing about Nashville. You would know more than I, but I was there uh, at a sort of a crucial point in my life when I was looking for something to do, and I went down on assignment from the New Yorker magazine. I wrote an article about, about the Grand Ole Opry and their last show at, uh, at the old Ryman Auditorium, the old Gospel Tabernacle down, in, right. down near uh, Broadway and Tootsie's Orchid Lounge and Ernest Tubbs Record Shop. That was in uh, 1974 in March. Richard Nixon was in serious trouble here in Washington, and he went down to, to be there uh, for the first performance out in their big suburban hall. And, um, and I wrote about their last show at the Ryman Auditorium. And, um, and out, of that, uh, out of that show, I, I, I looked at it and thought this would be interesting to do. Um, and uh, being an English major, I had a lifelong ambition to sing on stage in front of people. <laughs> and uh, so I went up to Minnesota and I started the show. That was a, it, was a, it was a great time backstage at the old Ryman Auditorium. Porter Wagner and Dolly uh, Parton was singing for Beech Nut Chewing Tobacco. And, um, and Stonewall Jackson, the shortest man in country music. And, and Loretta Lynn got off a big bus in a kind of a enormous white, enormous white, antebellum dress and her hair piled up high, 
big hair, beautiful singers, and such sweet people. We've been trying to emulate them ever since. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>